So, um, yeah, there we go. Okay. So, um, my goals with this um, were, first of all, just to sort of blow through some quick stuff, which is sort of an update on um, staging, because I don't know that um, everyone necessarily is well informed about the pretext and post text um, staging of hepatoblastomas. And then after that, get into um, some of the current recommendations from COG in terms of um, resections of tumors based on that staging. And then hopefully at the end, um, get into the area of controversy. And with hepatoblastoma, we don't really have um, the, the areas of controversy aren't, don't have studies that are well-powered like neuroblastoma. And so um, it really is, I think, um, maybe an area for more debate and um, probably has a lot of opinion built into it. So, um, so this is the first scenario that I um, put up to cover this um, staging issue. And um, so you have a two-year-old boy who presents to the emergency room with abdominal pain, lethargy, uh, five-pound weight loss, jaundice, and dark urine. Um, on exam, has a large abdominal mass. And uh, CT of the pelvis is done with IV contrast. It shows the image, which shows you know, multifocal disease affecting um, all sectors of the liver with an elevated AFP. <clears throat> so the presumptive diagnosis of hepatoblastoma is made based on that. Um, how, how would people um, uh, stage this patient? So 75% are saying four. Okay. 80%. Okay, so, so yeah, so, um, so the, the issue of staging, so, so pretext staging, um, sorry, pretext staging stands for pretreatment extent of disease, and um, this staging system is based on segmental liver anatomy, and the important thing about this is this is staging prior to chemotherapy has been given, so, so this patient is definitely a pretext, and um, and then, the, you know, I've tried to make it relatively straightforward as one or four, and you know, with multifocal uh, disease, you're clearly not going to be a one. Um, the interesting thing about pretext staging is that um, it has a tendency to overstage. Um, because this is based purely on imaging, and many of these tumors are so bulky, um, it, it's hard to assess whether or not there's true vascular invasion sometimes, or if it's just a big um, mass effect of the tumor sort of pressing on. Oral uh, vein, hepatic veins, things of that nature. Uh, post text uh, in contradistinction, refers to extended disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy has been given. So um, these are just some images that I borrowed from um, a COG website. And you can see that pretext stage one involves one sector of disease. Um, two involves uh, two sectors. The disease uh, of the liver. Um, three is three sectors, um, with one specifically spared because it's not um, necessarily three contiguous. And then four is um, the, the image that I show, which is multifocal disease. So, um, so the next question for the audience would be which of the following other considerations are not factored into staging? Getting the pull up in a second. We can blow through this. Yeah, quickly, I, guess I guess we're having an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So basically, um, and the extra medullary hematopoiesis is not involved. I mean, there are a bunch of additional annotations that are made. I think the two key ones that people look at are involvement of the retrohepatic cava or um, hepatic veins, and then um, the portal vein uh, bifurcation. Um, whether or not that's involved. So this image isn't coming up clearly, but um, for some reason the slide's not loaded right. But the, the image that I have, um, let's just say that you have a tumor that's classified as a pretext two. There's no involvement of the retrohepatic cava or the um, hepatic veins, and the portal vein confluence is spared. So appropriate management um, strategies for this patient would include the following. Is that up? People can actually pull off of it. Or? Yeah. Mark, can we get these poles? Or? We're not seeing them. 
Sorry, Matt. We'll try so, to get the so polls. That's okay. So, so we can just sort of go through it. I mean, um, the, the question is really, I think, boils down to um, what would people do in the setting of a pretext 2 with no involvement of the um, hepatic veins or portal veins. So maybe while we're waiting for that to come up, we could just... Yeah, and, and Mark, if you can't find the polls, at least just write A, B, C, D, yeah, even if you can't. Um, the last two we don't see. There, there it goes. Something's open. You have to scroll up to it. So, you had commented before about the fact that the, the pretext overstages uh, patients, and uh, in a case like this, would you base this on uh, what kind of imaging studies do you get? to make this kind of a decision? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So I think, I think there's, um, people favor different things. Some people look at um, CT um, with multi-contrast phase, and other people favor MR. Um, and I think that, uh, I, I don't know that one's been shown to be superior, um, but I think clearly cross-sectional imaging is absolutely critical to, to staging these. So does anybody get other studies other than would you get a CT or an MR? Steve, would you use CT or MR in your institution? Well, we're using more and more MR. MR? MR? Both. Both. Yeah. Well, that's it my, seems they all end one up of my concerns both. is frequently yeah. uh, we end up yeah, they all end both. up with both somehow. Any role for PET scan? I don't know that PET's really, I mean, yeah, I don't think deal. PET's going to be useful hmm. to assess. Yes, they have one available in your yeah. hospital. <laughs> <laughs> However, the converse is also true. If you have one available, then everybody gets <laughs> right. Well, I mean, our we don't even have the, the oncologists are just getting PET scans and more and more patients yeah. in the diffuse area, and then it's like you have information and kind of what do you do with it? Yeah. Type of thing. Because if you're going to make a decision based on the pretext uh, staging, it, you have to be able to trust your imaging. Uh, or your imaging may play a factor in the answer to this question as to whether you think you would proceed directly to surgery or not. Absolutely. And so the the audience, sixty percent, is going with B. So getting chemo first. Get chemo first. So yeah. So this so this is sort of an interesting thing because if you look at the um, recommendations uh, by COG, they would say that you know if you can get um, a clear margin um, on a pretext two. Um, you know, a good margin, one centimeter margin, doesn't involve any of the vascular structures that you just go for the um, hepatectomy up front. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I think that they're pretty clear also that um, they feel that this is not something that necessarily gets referred to an area of, you know, expertise in liver resection, that the ones and twos, um, if the surgeon feels competent, should be resected locally, which is sort of interesting. Well, your diagram showed the tumor pretty close to the portal right. vessel, so I think that might have scared some people, because right. you yeah. want a margin. Yes, absolutely. So, so and, and this issue of margin I bring up later on, um, because I think it, um, there's some controversy there, too, um, in terms of what people refer to as a negative margin. Um, people talk about shaving um, tumors off the vessels and whether or not that's a negative margin or whether... Um, you know, cautery artifact actually obscures the fact that you may or may not actually have a negative margin. People use the CUSA to come through the um, liver. That there's actually, you know, some width there, probably, you know, five, six <coughs> millimeters of tissue division. And so does t some of your tissue margin actually go um, up the suction That's device? Right. And so, you know. But some of, the, some of the decisions on this may also be uh, related to differences in philosophy in the approach in the United States versus the approach in Europe. Is that true? Um, certainly for Wilms tumor, there is the European approach is to get chemotherapy first, no matter what. Yes, um, I think that's true. I think that um, interestingly, the um, it's from from what I've uh, read, it seems to me that the um, North American and European um, approaches seem to be converging similarly. I think that's true. I mean, people like Rebecca Myers, who has spent years getting those, uh, getting the two groups to come together on uh, on an approach, because as you mentioned at the outset, there are very few, there are what, 100 hepatoblastomas in the country a year, so the only way 
uh, to make progress with this is to, to have a um, combined approach with the European groups. And Rebecca spent a lot of time getting that organized. Um, so another thing I think that's worth uh, mentioning here is just um, this issue of tumor shrinkage. We were talking about chemotherapy effect. And um, with hepatoblastoma, I think the, the recommendations are pretty clear now that most of the shrinkage of the tumor volume that you're going to get is going to be within the first two cycles. And so there are some, you know, groups that in the past have advocated for giving more chemo before proceeding with resection. And I think now the, the recommendations are pretty clear that after two cycles, if you haven't shrunk to a point that makes the tumor resectable, that the patient be evaluated for transplant. Um, there's been some nice studies done on that. The other interesting thing about that, um, I think the group out of Vanderbilt looked at this, but the, the, the ways in which the tumor shrink is um, something to consider because, um, you know, some people would, would say, well, you know, if you give more chemo, maybe you get more of a vascular margin. It turns out that as the tumor shrinks, it doesn't really shrink away from the vascular supply um, all that all that much. And so, um, so that's sort of, an, you know, it shrinks down yeah, in terms of size. It doesn't give you more of a margin. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe, maybe you preserve so, parenchyma, but not uh, vascular margin. So don't do... So don't do chemo for the vascular margin. Exactly. Wow. So, so, so when you evaluate imaging, do you want a one centimeter margin? Is that what you'd recommend to the audience? Yes, I would say a one centimeter margin is By is the goal. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, if you if you look at the survival results, I mean, I'm sure you're probably going to show the data. If you can get if you can get the thing out. Don't those patients do better? They tend to do better, and you know, and. We'll go through a little bit of this because I think some of the controversy exists. Who has better survival? Um, somebody who has a very extended resection, like you know, a, a right trisegmentectomy, or somebody who goes on and just gets a transplant. And I think um, in years past, it was felt that um, very extensive or quote unquote heroic resections um, were undertaken. You know, things like um, tumor, you know, liver explants with back table resections and then reimplants portal vein reconstructions, um, hepatic vein reconstructions. And I think the, the take-home message from that after it having been done for years um, is that the survival in those patients is actually not as good as the transplant survival. And so there's been sort of this move away from some of these sort of quote, quote, heroic resections. Yeah, but, but I, I think, think the, other... Also, the other question is chemo. You know, if, if, you, if, if you're going to commit them to two rounds of chemo, those patients that get chemo don't have as high survival as a primary resection, or do they? That's the question. Well, I was just going to say, prior to that, the previous discussion about you should, if you can get it out, you should try to get it out because they have a better survival. But if you try to get it out and you can't, and they require, yeah. then you have they, not done them a favor because right. then they have worse survival. So you have to be pretty confident that you're going to be successful in getting them out. With a margin, or is that what you're With a margin. Yeah. Uh, although I, in, you know the data better than I, but the, the significance of a microscopic margin is unclear. What's the incidence of the ones that uh, they recently opt for a liver transplant getting a liver transplant? Right. Uh, what is the availability of organs? Because you have to factor that into which course you're going to take. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's an important um, point is, you know, when, when you're looking at, and I probably have a slide on this, but... Um, when, when you're looking at patients that are going to go the route of transplant versus a right trisegmentectomy, you have to say, well, you know, if we put them into the transplant group, number one, what's organ availability like? And number two, you've committed now a very young child to lifelong immunosuppression, Correct. which is not um, an entirely benign thing. So, um, but to Dr. Von Allman's point, you know, these, what they call rescue transplants, in other words, a failed resection that then goes on and needs a transplant, those... Uh, patients, it's pretty clear, do fare do worse off than mm -hmm. patients that are a planned transplant up front. Yeah, so that's been my rule of thumb. If I don't think I can get a margin and they don't respond to chemo so I can get a margin, they should be referred for transplant before resection. Is that still true? Yeah, so, so the, that's, the that's current... That's a critical uh, point. Yeah, yeah I, I think the current thinking is that you refer to the transplant center early. It doesn't necessarily mean that the patient's going to go towards transplant you still might give two cycles of chemo and see where you end up, but at least you want the patient plugged into the system, have all the pre-transplant evaluation done, and sort of have them sort of plugged in in the event that they need to go that route. I think the concept is that the patients 
in whom transplantation is done as salvage therapy don't do as well as a primary transplant. Right. That's very clear. Yes. The primary transplant patient does surprisingly well. You know, doing a transplant and immunizing somebody against <laughs> rejection who has cancer has always been a, a, a major question. Is that a safe thing to do? And it seems as though uh, the liver patients do extremely well following the transplantation despite being immunosuppressed. And so, so should all these complex liver resections, the hepatoblastoma, be done in a, here we go back again. You took but the words critical, right out of my mouth. I was going to ask yeah, it exactly it's, the it's, same question. But it's question. a critical question we have to ask ourselves in a session like this. Should they be done in centers that do pediatric liver transplants? Uh, I think that's the way they do it at the UK. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a critical, you know, obviously a very complicated uh, question in terms of uh, Same with referral. biliary atresia. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so for the but people... But biliary atresia is different. Uh, that's, that operation, it's not a big operation. It's easy to do. But the transplant it's, is. So they, they, all those patients who have biliary atresia are referred up front to a transplant center. See, but they have time. I mean, yeah. biliary atresia, right. you, you slowly get sick over yeah. time. This is different. These people, these children are going to get sick fairly quickly. If you're in a place that doesn't have a transplant program, you can't do all the uh, arranging uh, for a potential transplant. I'm not advocating total uh, specialization for everything we do, but these are issues that are in the current era important to look at. So, so for the people who are at non-transplant centers, do you have criteria that you use to try? How would you? manage a patient who has a questionably resectable tumor? Would you do this it? This conference you... appears to be inactive and will be ended soon. <laughs> oh, okay. you have... <laughs> okay, that's enough. Saved by the bell. Back <laughs> Any key Mark, on your telephone are we off the air? We just got a message. Got uh, audio feed. I think the audio is down. Okay. Okay. So, so non-transplant center surgeons I don't even know how many we have. Oh, that's here. A, yeah, that'd be us, yeah. So, <laughs> so what, what, how do you manage? Because you do liver, right. tra liver research. So, I, I, I think if there's, I need to feel very comfortable that I can do the resection. I mean, you know, first of all, you have to decide are you comfortable doing major liver resections. Assuming that, then I need to feel very comfortable before I start the procedure that I'm going to, I'm going to succeed. And that's not that you couldn't have a complication or problem, but that, Within my skill set, there's a 95% chance that we're gonna we're gonna do that. And if I don't feel confident with that, then I will refer them to a transplant center because to be in between is, I think, you've you've done a significant disservice. It's risky business. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for us, I think if you can do an anatomic resection right. with a good margin, I think right. that's fine. You would proceed down. But if it's anything close to the hepatic veins, if you have disease that extends across the liver or anything in the portal vein, you should send it. And would you give pre-op chemotherapy to get to that point, or would you send them before? Uh, well, you know, we've, we've actually had three in the last two months, and then we go six months and don't really have them. I think it's case by case, but we have sent, sent them early when we just as surgeons felt like um, they couldn't be resectable. And I, I would say we've had a couple that we sent to your institution for that, and you guys were able to safely resect it. Um, because you probably had a little bit more confidence and do a lot more uh, liver resections, and the patient never did need a transplant. So I think that's another bag. But, but, but that brings up another, I don't want to be creating all these paradigms, but brings up another situation that's real, and that is that the liver transplant surgeon has a lot of experience with operating on the liver. And so if there are issues being close to the portal vein, being close to the hepatic veins, it's not so bad to have somebody like that that might be available to help the pediatric surgeon who's done a lot of livery sections do it even better in this day and age. And there's no reason that the, the scans can't be sent to somebody from that center to have them look at to help you make the decision if that's somebody they should see earlier. It's nothing not. like looking at the anatomy with the belly open. <laughs> <laughs> we do all these laparoscopically. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So yeah, well, despite despite all the imaging that, that that's available, uh, I think anybody who's done a fair number of liver resections will tell you that the truth is at the time of the operation Absolutely. whether it's resectable or not. Yeah, despite of all that, and uh, <coughs> the people in Europe 
early on, we'll give all liver tumors chemotherapy up front and then do the surgery because it's easier, it's smaller tumor, it's, it's, they it's, it's, perhaps can avoid transplantation. Yeah. And that was their reasoning for it. But uh, in, in our country, avoiding a transplant, lifelong immunosuppression, you know, is something, if you can avoid it, it's probably okay. So I, I would not hesitate doing a trisegmentectomy for cure. And perhaps in certain centers, may, I know Mike has had some experience doing central hepatectomies, which is a difficult operation, but he's done them successfully, and the patients have been cured without requiring a transplant. So, the, the, you know, there's a lot of thought process that goes into it. But certainly those uh, procedures should be done by experienced personnel. We've had a couple kids who are over the age of three, like eight and nine with hepatoblastoma. Likewise, we've had hepatocellular. Do you biopsy kids outside? Do you have a, do you biopsy before you treat with chemo, just to be sure it's really a hepato, one or the other? And how do you do that? Do you do it open or do you do it? Yeah, so, so I think um, based on what I've read, um, it seems that the field is sort of divided. So there are some people that would say you could do core needle biopsies. And they usually recommend, I think, uh, about 10 passes of the needle and that you're supposed to go through an area that includes normal parenchyma and that, um, and obviously, you know, you get tumor uh, as well. Our practice has not necessarily been to do that. We typically do an open wedge if we're, you know, to, to get tissue. But I'd be interested to see what other people do. You got about okay, I think we got to... We're going to have to yeah. move yeah, Is there along. any final final things that you wanted to hit before we move, but you've got in, a, in the last final 60 seconds? Yeah, well, the only other thing I would say is that I think a, a topic of debate um, is really this other issue of pulmonary metastases in hepatoblastoma and the treatment of the pulmonary mets, because um, there are two different camps on this issue. And one would say, you know, if you... Um, you should resect the metastases up front and then go on to do your um, hepatectomy after. There's others that would say, um, well, you know, the, the growth factors that are secreted by the liver as it regenerates are going to stimulate growth of other sites in the lung that may not have been previously recognized. And so that maybe there's a benefit to waiting and doing it after because then you can actually clear them of disease. But I, I don't know that there's good data on either side of this. All of it's limited to a handful of patients in, in both sets. So. Matt, w one last question on that. Uh, the, the thought had been that, that if they're treated with chemotherapy and have stage 4 disease and the tumor in the lung disappears on chemotherapy alone, do you go ahead and do the transplant or do you do the resection? And what happens then if you have everything that responds, but you only have one or two nodules left in the lung that didn't respond to chemotherapy, would yes. you operate on those patients? Right. And so, um, so again, that's um, a small subset of uh, patients, and the, the papers that are out there are limited literally to a cohort of, I think, less than 20 um, where this has really been looked at. So it's hard to really draw any good conclusions. Um, the... The other piece to this is that there may be some selection bias in what's reported or reporting bias because if you have a good response to chemo and you go on to do a transplant and your patient is a long-term survivor, that's a patient that gets reported as a success. But I don't know that they, um, all the failures are being um, reported. So to that point, um, there's um, a group, and I think this would just be the last little thing to mention, there's a group... Um, called, um, let's see if I can go back to it, this Pluto, um, this Pediatric Liver Unresectable Tumor Observatory. And this is um, an international group, and, and they're really seeking to answer those questions because it's not answerable at individual centers or even multi-centers within, I think, North America or Europe. This really takes, you know, a global initiative to answer some of these questions. And so they're looking at all these things, but I think it's probably going to be several years before we can really answer any of those questions. Okay. Thank you very much.